In this video, we're going to review for the first semester lab final. So in this video, we're going to go through the concepts that we talked about in the various labs, and we're going to talk about the labs that we performed. So the first test that we did, the first lab that we did, was the flame test. So the flame test is a qualitative test that's used to identify metal ions in a compound. So when we say qualitative, we didn't collect any numbers in the lab. We were simply making observations. So in the flame test, we exposed a sample to the flame and electrons absorbed that thermal energy. Thermal just means heat. And the electrons moved to a higher energy level. Then electrons can't stay there forever. They release energy in the form of a photon. That's the light that you observe. And the electron returns to its original energy level. Now, a limitation of the flame test is that every ion emits a unique wavelength of light, and this is due to the difference in energy levels. So on a diagram, we have some electrons orbiting the nucleus. So here is an electron, and in the flame test, like I said, it absorbs energy, so it is going to move to a higher energy level. So that is the first thing that happens. The second thing that happens is that electron will return to its original spot. And in doing so, it releases energy in the form of a photon. And that is the light that your eye picks up during the lab. The next thing that we did was we observed chemical reactions. And evidence of a chemical reaction includes a change in color, a formation of a gas, formation of a precipitate, and precipitate is just a fancy way of saying there's a solid or something that will, um, a difference in layers maybe, or like it'll turn cloudy. So it's a solid that forms essentially. Uh, change in uh, odor, change in temperature, and something, something is burning. All right, so on our periodic table, we have rows or periods, okay, and they're numbered here. Every time we go down a period, our atom gets bigger. So in that first period, we have one energy level. In the second period, we have two energy levels. And valence electrons are the electrons in the outermost energy level. As those electrons get further and further away from the nucleus, they tend to be more reactive. So what happens as you go down a group in a periodic table, the atom gets more reactive because those valence electrons get further and further away. So if I were looking at, let's say, magnesium and strontium, for example, strontium is going to be more reactive because it is a much bigger atom. Now from left to right in the same period, so like, you know, uh, magnesium and aluminum, for example. They're both atoms that have three energy levels, but magnesium has 12 protons, aluminum has 13 protons. More protons, more pull. So that means that even though they both have three energy levels, draw it like that. That means that the protons in magnesium, I apologize, aluminum, are going to pull everything in a lot tighter. There's more of a pull in aluminum, so it's going to pull everything in a lot tighter. More protons, more pull. Because it's pulling everything a lot tighter, those valence electrons are closer to the nucleus, and they're going to be less reactive. So, in the case of magnesium and aluminum, aluminum will be less reactive because it is a smaller atom. The electrons are brought in closer by the larger nucleus. Okay, the next thing that we talked about uh, in Unit 3 and the end of Unit 3, beginning of Unit 4, are ionic and covalent compounds. So ionic compounds are between a metal cation and a nonmetal anion. So going back to our periodic table, everything on the left side of our periodic table, well, actually to the left of our staircase, let me just erase this really quick. Um, so our staircase is here, and it's darkened in. So everything to the left of that 
is a cation. Everything to the right of that is an anion. Everything to the left of that wants to um, lose electrons. Everything to the right of that wants to gain electrons. So sodium chloride, for example, Na, and then Cl, that's a metal and a nonmetal. That's an ionic compound. Um, when we have ionic compounds, electrons are transferred from cation to anion. So you might have something like this. Um, so I think we're using NaCl. So Na has one valence electron. Chlorine has seven. Just throw these in there really quick. So sodium is going to transfer an electron from cation to anion. Those are ionic compounds. Ionic compounds transfer. Covalent compounds are nonmetals. So basically everything to the right of the staircase. And in covalent compounds, electrons are shared between atoms. So a good example would be CO2. Okay, So in CO2, you have carbon. Why is my pen not drawing anymore? Okay, I think my pen is dead. Well, that's okay. So I'll just do it with the mouse. So carbon has four. Oxygen has six. And there are two of them. So that will be 12 total electrons. So if I add these up, 12 and 4 is 16. So carbon always goes in the middle. Put carbon there, put oxygen here, and oxygen here. Okay, and then we single bond everything. So each single bond is 2, so 2, 4. 16 minus 4 is 12. Okay, so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, right? Everybody wants to have 8. Each oxygen has 8, carbon only has 4, so I am going to share some more electrons here, and I'm going to do it on both sides. So I'm going to share. Sharing is caring. Ah, look at that. Everybody's happy. So in a covalent compound, you have these bonds right here where we are sharing electrons. So those are covalent compounds. Okay, there are two types of covalent compounds. You have a polar covalent compound, and that's where all atoms attached to the central atom are the same, and you don't have any lone pair of electrons on the central atom. Those are, uh, ooh, I have these backwards. Let me scratch that out. That should be nonpolar. Nonpolar. Okay. And then this would be polar covalent. There we go. Just a quick fix. Okay. So nonpolar covalent. All atoms attached to the central atom are the same. No lone pair of electrons on the central atom. Okay. In a polar covalent, not every atom attached to the central atom is the same. Oh, so it is asymmetrical. And lone pairs of electrons are on the central atom. And we'll look at some Lewis diagrams here in a second. But let's take a look at the properties. So we did a lab where we observed different properties, and we had to classify the substance as ionic, polar covalent, or nonpolar covalent. So the first thing to note here is ionic compounds are really, really strong. You have a cation and an anion. That's like true love in a Disney movie. It is a bond that is very difficult to break. So as a result, you're going to have really high melting and boiling points, like really, really, really high, because that bond is so strong. Ionic compounds dissolve in water, which is polar. They do not dissolve in oil, which is nonpolar. Ionic compounds are not conductive as a solid, but when you dissolve them in water, the ions are free to flow, and you will conduct electricity. Okay, covalent molecules are going to have lower melting and boiling points than ionic compounds. Polar is going to be stronger. Nonpolar is going to be weaker. Polar compounds will dissolve in polar substances, and then nonpolar compounds will dissolve in nonpolar substances. Okay, so that's an important distinction you need to know. Um, covalent molecules do not conduct electricity. So that is a very important property to remember. Ionic only when dissolved in water, will conduct electricity. Okay, so how do you identify polar from nonpolar? Well, as I mentioned earlier, nonpolar covalent molecules will have the same thing attached to the central atom all the way around. It is symmetrical all the way around. Okay, so that is nonpolar covalent. 
The other thing that you want to notice here, we have two atoms. This is like a tug of war. They are the same thing, pulling in opposite directions, and they cancel each other out. So as long as you have two of the same things, they will cancel each other out when there is not a central atom. Okay. Um, just another quick thing to notice here on the first shape, we do not have any dots or lone pairs on our central atom. For polar covalent molecules, they are asymmetrical, meaning they have different things attached to the central atom. So we have hydrogen and we have chlorine. Those are not the same. So it is asymmetrical. That will be a polar molecule. Uh, another thing I want to point out on the second one is we have a lone pair of electrons on our central atom. Even though it is hydrogen all the way around, that lone pair of electrons makes it a polar molecule. Uh, one other one that I want to show you really quick that is not shown is HF. So this is a tug of war where you have an unequal amount of force. So it is going to create a pull. So a difference in electronegativity here will make uh, a pull. Okay. Now, nonpolar molecules like these are only going to have London dispersion as their intermolecular force. That is the only IMF that is present on nonpolar molecules. Polar molecules will also have London dispersion, but they will also have dipole dipole every single time. So on a polar molecule, you will have these two forces every single time. And this is easy to remember because dipole, polar, kind of the same thing. All right. Now, in some cases, you will also have hydrogen bonding. And in order to have hydrogen bonding, you have to have one of these three bonds in your molecule. HF, HO, HN. And an easy way to remember that, it spells phone. So water is a great example of a polar molecule that has hydrogen bonding. This is a polar molecule because it has lone pair of electrons on the central atom. And if you notice, it also has a hydrogen oxygen bond, which is on our list. So that makes this one a polar molecule. So it would have London dispersion, dipole dipole, and hydrogen bonding. Okay, in terms of IMFs, this is pretty easy to remember. So LDF is a very low strength intermolecular force. So it is going to have the lowest boiling point, lowest melting point, low viscosity. Viscosity is the bubble test, so the bubble is going to move very fast when you have low viscosity and low surface tension. So we aren't going to be able to fit very many drops of this liquid onto a penny. Because the intermolecular forces are so weak, it is going to have a very fast evaporation rate. Okay. Hydrogen bonding is the strongest intermolecular force, so it is going to have high properties. It is going to have a high boiling point, a high melting point. It is going to have high viscosity, so our bubble in a liquid, when we tip a test tube over, is going to move um, very slow, and we are going to fit a large number of drops on a penny. Water is a great example. As I mentioned previously, we could fit a lot of drops of liquid onto a penny. When we did it in class, I believe we had students who were able to get 100, 200 drops of water onto a penny before it spilled over. Because it has very high intermolecular forces, it is going to have a very slow evaporation rate. And the most important thing I want you to remember is like dissolves like. So nonpolar molecules will only dissolve in nonpolar liquids. Polar molecules will only dissolve in polar liquids. And those are the different labs we ran this semester. Good luck and have fun.